Uh, so this is a patient whose status post retransplant, and uh, with retransplant cases, we do a standard uh, upper GI post op, uh, and it's part of the protocol. Uh, and the reason is because of this anatomy. Uh, so there's the the CBDs here and the duodenum is here. So it's a cholidogo duodenostomy. And the teaching point here is uh, to discuss indications for cholidogo duodenostomy. Uh, so there are three indications. Uh, one is this case, which is a retransplant. Uh, we also do cholidogo duodenum in two other scenarios, PSE in primary sclerosing cholangitis, because the whole biliary system is pathologic. And so they remove the entire biliary system down to the ampulla, so they'll do a cholidogal duodenostomy. And the third indication is if there's a duct-to-duct -duct mismatch uh, and they're not able to appropriately you know, get an, a good anastomosis, then in those cases, they'll also do a cholidogal duodenostomy. Okay, wait, wait, wait. I'm, I've never seen this before. So I, I always thought, okay, for a regular liver transplant, you can either do a bile duct to bile duct anastomosis, cholidoco docostomy or bile duct to jejunum cholidoco jejunostomy. And you're saying in this case, you're getting the distal common bile duct and sewing it to the duodenum. Yes. And the location of the duodenum is also kind of important, actually. Because, yeah. It looks like it's um, kind of anterior. Yeah. Like they've pulled it. Yes. Yes. So I, uh, that was the other teaching point. So uh, so in, in these cases, I, so then in these cases, I you have to put them right lateral um, so that you could drain it into the duodenum. I, I didn't do this specific upper GI, but on the ones that I do, I put them right lateral because you have it has you have to look specifically at the anterior, kind of like at eleven o'clock position. You know, if you're looking at the duodenum in the cross section, because uh, the looking normal for like location a is like anastomosis there. Yes, yes, that's exactly what they're looking for. And this is just routine protocol upper GI that they do um, after uh, this anastomosis. So just know that the, the, the new anastomosis is different location. Very interesting. This, this little signal is just the prior um, CBD. So this patient didn't have PSE, so they, they didn't have to dissect down and take out the entire CBD. They left the distal CBD, but it was a retransplant. So it's much easier to do this in a retransplant case. Interesting. And why don't they just do a cholidoco jejunostomy? Like pull up a loop of jejunum? Uh, that's a good question. I don't know. This is what they do. Um, like a hepatical J, you mean? Maybe they have enough length so they don't have to pull up a J. Got it. Yeah, yeah. That's what I meant, hepatical J. But um, yeah, I just, I've never seen, I've never seen this. So very cool. Yeah. Okay. So this was a patient with a positive pregnancy test mm. and we have a transvaginal ultrasound here and you can mm. see that the uterus is antiverted and the mutual cavity is here and we don't, we see a little bit of fluid in the no in mutual cavity. We see a complex fluid in the cul-de-sac mm -hmm. and it was far enough along that we felt like we should have seen a gestational sac. Um, I don't remember exactly what the HCG was, but it was basically an empty endometrium. And this was the right ovary. Actually, yeah, right there, that's the right ovary. Very fluid. And then this was the left adnexa. So there was this kind of like echogenic structure here in the left adnexa mm. and this free fluid. So what do you think? Uh, I think that could be- uh, Let's say the HCG was like 8,000. Ectopic, like a hemorrhagic ectopic or- uh, Yeah, exactly. So we uh, were concerned that this was an ectopic, like HCG was really high, no intrauterine pregnancy. And then the question is, what do you think about this hemoperitoneum? Are you going to say this is now a ruptured ectopic? I mean, what, where, like, what could the blood be coming from? Uh, That's than, the question. 
the ruptured, <laughs> could it be like, I mean, it was like a ruptured hemorrhagic cyst. I mean, that'd be weird. No, no, no. Okay. So let's just say we're uh, really suspicious. This is an ectopic. And then there's, we're suspicious that there's hemoperitoneum. So are you going to say that this ectopic has ruptured? Uh, I think it's something worth raising. Okay, good. So that, that that's the teaching point in this case is that, you know, we raised this, but like um, we learned that hemoperitoneum does not always mean that it's ruptured. And I'm going to show, um, do you see this radiographics article mm -hmm. here? Yeah. Oops. Oh, uh, let me go back. Okay. So this is this radiographics article that says ectopic pregnancy hemoperitoneum does not equate tubal rupture. Um, so it's interesting because this is an editorial, but basically they're saying that in, in response to this fallopian tube radiographics article that said, like, whenever you see hemoperitoneum, you should be concerned about it ruptured ectopic. Um, they basically said that, like, hemoperitoneum does not necessarily mean tubal rupture. So the ectopic itself can just bleed and then the blood can come out of the fallopian tube. And it's really like there's no data to support that, like, hemoperitoneum means that it's ruptured at all. And the reason that that's important is that you can actually like ruptured ectopic is you go to the you go to surgery, you, you know, you um, maybe remove the fallopian tube, et cetera. Whereas if it's non ruptured, it could be cons uh, treated conservatively. And actually here's another article from uh, ultrasound and OBGYN. And they were talking about like, does uh, with hemoperitoneum, does it require surgery? And they basically, their conclusion was that like, it's not, it's not an absolute contraindication to conservative management. So basically you have to see how the patient's doing, how their HCG is trending, how much hemoperitoneum there is. It could just be a sign that the ectopic itself is bleeding, not necessarily ruptured. And um, the, the reason that also makes a difference is that um, you have more preserved fertility if you don't go to surgery. When, when, when is, what are the indications for surgery other than a ruptured ectopic? Like the size or yeah, I, I, or I, like time I out from. <laughs> I don't know like, further you know, details. I think gestation. you have to take all the uh, all of the factors into consideration. But just because we see like hemoperitoneum, and, and actually in the other article it does say if you have a large volume of hemoperitoneum, then you should be more concerned. Yeah. But if it's maybe just like a smaller volume in the cul-de-sac, that doesn't necessarily mean it's ruptured. Mm. So anyway. Uh, this is a patient who had an MR enterography uh, performed and, uh, for kind of bowel symptoms. Uh, it was negative. Uh, bowel was negative, but there was an incidental finding of this. Renal yeah. lesion? Yeah. So um, this was, uh, here's the kind of the delayed phase. It does enhance. Let me uh, give you the arterial phase. Right there, there's your enhancement, uh, and then we didn't, we don't get, we don't get, we uh, in an post phase on our enterography protocol, so we don't have the in a post phase imaging. Oh, there it is. There's your mass. And wait, so I feel like this would be a good one for the CCLS, the clear cell likelihood score. I don't think you can do it without the. Oh phase. right, yeah, but I will say, okay, some thoughts that come to mind is it's yeah. kind of. T2 bright. It's T2 brighter than the cortex. Yes. And seems to be enhancing and washing out. Yes. So my two main things that I think about are a clear cell RCC and a lipid poor AML. Um, let's see. That's not it. And actually the lipid poor AML should be like a little bit T2 darker, not as T2 bright because Correct. it has more muscle. That's right. So I'm still now concerned about a clear cell RCC because it's T2 bright with enhancement and washout. Uh, and, and then the patient got a staging CT. We recommended a renal mass protocol, but the patient got a staging CT instead. So ignore the cyst. Here it is. What's the diagnosis now? It has fat in it. Oh, wait. Yes. Wait, 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 yes. So, <laughs> so sorry, I should have said a regular AML. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yep. And yeah. so when I first saw the MR, I, mean, I read the CT, when I looked at the MR, I, I thought I saw the angular margins, right? The ice cream cone sign uh, right there, you see? right? Kind of this nice. sharp demarcation. Yeah. And I'm like, oh, this is an AML, but we don't have 
in an opposed phase, and we don't have a uh, fat saturated T2. Uh, you know, we don't have the pre like non fat and fat saturated, so to say if it's AML or not. And uh, that's why CT is incredibly helpful. Yeah, CT is so helpful. That, for AML. Right. So this patient was scheduled for surgery uh, and now should not be getting a surgery. And you know, the when do we do renal mass characterization with MR? And I think in the setting of small renal masses, I think all of our renal masses should get characterized uh, because exactly right. You can get lipopore AML. Oh, you can in this case a regular AML, um, and the renal mass protocol will distinguish those from malignant lesions. It actually kind of also makes the case that like maybe even an enterography should have an in and out just because there's so many like adrenal adenomas or like, I don't know, there's so many, you know, fatty liver, which is really important that, that we could diagnose on those same patients, you know? Yeah. This patient also had what looked like hepatic steatosis on the T2, but we didn't have it in and post phase. So I couldn't really say much about it, but on the CT, it, you know, it was definitely suspicious, but how long is an in and post phase sequence? Is it? Does it justify know. the length? I don't, I don't think it's either. that long. No? Okay. Yeah. Something to bring up. Okay. Okay. So this is a patient who has a right-sided flank pain. Ooh. What do you think? Where is it coming from? Uh, Basically, we... Kidney? Kidney. Exactly. Like maybe yeah. there's a little bit of kidney here, but a, yeah. there's this large heterogeneous T2 hyperintense and heterogeneous mass coming from the right kidney um, border with the, with the liver is a little sketchy, but do you notice anything else? There's a big vessel immediately. Yeah. There's a huge flow void here. Right. So what do you think about that? There's a is it like is it where is it is it the portal vein or what is it where is it coming from um here i'll go to the post contrast um so here oops okay here's the arterial face oh boy okay so, oh oh my gosh okay oh my gosh what's going on okay so that is the ivc uh no ivc no. is over here so we're in oh, the right. arterial phase ivc is right here renal vein is coming in oh so it's getting displaced immediately yeah. Um, and then there's two big vascular structures here. I know this is hard if you're not scrolling yourself, but um, I'll just show you that was the arterial phase. And then this is the venous phase. So basically we were like, where are these coming from? Is this like a an anomalous, or the anomalous artery yeah. or the vein? Um, and then they uploaded a outside CT and you'll see on the arterial phase here, I'll take these graphics off. Okay, so the renal artery comes off and then becomes like sort of aneurysmal and then it becomes this huge aneurysm that then goes into the, the kidney. So there's a large renal artery aneurysm and there's also a large venous varix draining into the renal vein. So anyway, this was basically kind of like an, a large AVM um, in addition to the fact that they had this renal cell carcinoma, this was resected and the AVM was controlled and resected. They decided not to coil embolize it ahead of time. They just kind of like, we mapped it out vascularly, preoperatively, and the surgeons just clamped it off. Um, they were able to like control all the bleeding. And this came back clear cell RCC, which is not unexpected, with sar uh, sarcomatoid and rhabdoid features. So it was just an interesting case of a big gnarly RCC that had like neovascularity, um, but also a large AVM. And we really don't know if like, which came first, like maybe the AVM, I don't know, the increased vascular flow contributed to having a RCC or the RCC and in, like induced proliferation of this AVM, but um, it was just kind of really interesting. Uh, uh, what was I gonna say? I mean, never mind. <laughs> Well, and, and just like to also to show that CT sometimes is really better. Like we're always like raving. That's what I was going to say. Yeah. I was like, oh, CT like is so much easier in this case. Oh yeah. Um, we, we, we went over the MRI so many times and we're like, what's it connected to? And we just couldn't get the resolution. 
Yeah. Um, of like, which one is connected to what is that, you know, like, is that a vein or is that an artery? And they really wanted us to know, like wanted to know that. So they knew exactly what they were going to clamp off when they got in. So anyway, the CT was much better here. Okay. I'm gonna stop sharing. This is a patient with history of CLL leukemia and, you know, the patient we've been following these little lymph nodes. Uh, and I'm showing this case because there is non-CLL findings. Wait, scroll down to, through the bladder again? Yeah, sure. Oh, wait, and there was something in the rectum. So let me scroll down, down south. I see a nodular mass in the rectum concerning for rectal cancer. Yes, yes, uh, that's exactly right. Um, so, you know, it's it's not, I don't know, it's, I think rectal colorectal cancer is rising in prevalence. This was rectal cancer and something that we have to just be mindful of, got to comb through the colon carefully and, and the rectum in this case. Yeah. I tell my residents, like follow the colon on every patient, like not, you know, small bowel, we can look in the four quadrants, but rectal cancer or diverticulitis, very common and rectal cancer on the rise, like you said. So like really have to follow the colon carefully on every patient. Okay. Um, what do you guys think about this uterine finding here? Contraction looks benign. <laughs> cool. And why did you say contraction? I don't know because that's what they look like. You can see that the the uterus is very like it's abnormal, unusually T two hyper intense. We, we normally see it much lower than that. And I've seen this in um in like certain. I think it's around either like in the mid cycle when I, I think my metrium gets more edematous. This is more pronounced than usual. Anyway, so I think that the, the contraction is, is stands out more because of that. Huh, um, interesting. I never, I, yeah, I guess I didn't really think about, I've seen the uterus be really bright like this and I never really knew why. Junctional zone, not that prominent. You could have like, you could go down the path of like, is this an expanded junctional zone? Like, is this adenomyosis, but there's no like T2 cystic spaces and it's very geographic. Um, but yeah, you got it. This was a contraction. And the way we know that is that you know, this MRI took a while to do. And so <laughs> as the sequences go on, it gets smaller and smaller. Right. So here's the next sequence. We've got the axial and it looks smaller. And then um, by the time we get to the high resolution T2, it's basically gone. Right. And then yeah. we're down to our, and then here's our big field of view T2 and it's gone. So yeah. It was just a uterine contraction, and um, because MRI gives us multiple time points, we can uh, we can just like you know say that it's gone. So cool. Okay, go. Can we not record, or should we record? Yeah, yeah. Go ahead. Really? Okay. Uh, so this was a case. Uh, I'm looking at uh, at notes um, that Arthi wrote, and it. It was a biopsy proven pleosis sinusoidal dilatation. Uh, and uh, let me see if I can make this bigger. Well, making this worse not be easy. Uh, so this is here are And did this patient have a history of liver disease? That's what I'm saying. Liver looks pristine. And and you have an EAVIS down in the right lower quadrant, right? Right. Lower. I, I I would be shocked if this patient had any degree of significant fibrosis. Look how beautiful the liver looks. Nellie, I can't hear you if you're talking. Uh, I'm not. I'm listening, but you okay. can't hear it. What what, what, guess... what is your question? It's basically like this was a biopsy proven peliosis case, and you're asking if we should have been able to use LIRADS? 
Uh, yes. So I think you said like if you were going to lyra at this, it met the arterial enhancement, and uh, I said no, it doesn't meet the arterial enhancement criteria. Uh, no, no, right? It, it's it's okay. So so for arterial phase hyper enhancement, you have to see enhancement greater than the liver, right? So iso enhancement is not is not does not qualify as hyper hyper, right? It doesn't qualify as, as AFI. But more importantly, this liver looks beautiful. Okay. Oh, here's the companion case here. Maybe it says. This, look, this liver looks less beautiful. Yes. Yeah, so this was on surveillance uh, and it's been right. stable for actually a few years, a couple of years. Uh, and here it is. Here's a central enhancement. Right. So technically, yes, that qualifies as AFI, but there's no but. Wait, so if you just have that central enhancement, it's still it's still qualifies. Yeah, yeah. Like it's it's not a homogeneous enhancement. Doesn't have to be as long as it's not um, not in a rim fashion. It's you know you assess it as non rim. Uh, so oh. especially especially in really like. You will see it in like very aggressive HCCs, like in big ones, you know, those ugly ones, you'll see that they will, they, they'll they often have like very, um, almost like you, almost like you see the vessels going through the liver, the, through the lesion rather than the actual aphase. So that's okay. I mean, it's not as common as just like regular, whatever, regular, like uniform enhancement. Right. But it is, it does, it does qualify as aphase. Oh, gotcha. Okay. Now, um, in this particular case, I assume that this was like already known, right, for a while. Yeah, we've been following it, and it's right. been stable. So like you wouldn't like, and it's already path proven, so you wouldn't. You wouldn't. This is a second companion case. This one's not path proven, but it's been just actively surveyed because it there's been no change. Right. So then, like you would, you would probably assign it a like LR three or something, depending gotcha. on, you know. Okay, so all enhancement other than RIM enhancement qualify for AFI. As long as you have enhancement greater than, than the liver. Background. Yeah. Um, yeah, so so there's no like, there's no rule as to how much, what proportion of the lesion needs to be enhanced. And again, I have cases where like, very like super aggressive HCCs where like majority of the, of the lesion does not enhance and you have like little blotchy enhancement here and there. Um, and it's just like a super aggressive H to C. So you see that it's not, again, it's not as common, but you see that. Okay. You're so right, Arthi. That's awesome. And no, it, I guess it answers the question. It doesn't have to be homogeneous. Yep. Yeah, it does not. Um, but this one did look weird enough, like globular. Well, it was, it, it definitely okay. does not look like you or multifocal, whatever. But, and, and you could assign, let's say this was the first time you were seeing this and you're like, I, just some, you, you can assign LRM, which means like you just have to send the patient for biopsy, which I think in this case, like if, if the patient was coming out of blue and all you know is the patient has cirrhosis, you know, this is this warrants biopsy. So, all right. All right. So this was a, an interesting case. This was a, uh, a person, a woman, a woman, I don't know, the, the Sex is irrelevant. It was an inpatient who has history of AML and was spiking fevers. Um, fevers of unknown origin. And then a uh, patient had a pet. I don't know if the pet was done for fever or for like just, you know, happens to be inpatient. So we did pet for disease assessment. But what you can see is that liver was red as like just very heterogeneous with little foci of you know, pet activity, you know, don't know what it is, get a, get a you know, cross-sectional study, something like that. So the patient was spiking fevers and then the patient had, um, had an MR. You can see that, you know, patient's in patient, so the quality, you know, probably not optimal. And also you can see that the liver is really dark on T2. This is a, um, this is a T, uh, T uh, 1.5 Tesla study. And I also have art, you know, art of star uh, map. So, so patient does have, um, you know, hemocytorosis. 
you can see that, you know, we see these very blotchy kind of T2 hyperintense lesions, very not well defined, right? And they kind of sort of mirror what we saw on, um, on PET, like kind of very ill-defined kind of blotchy stuff. And you can see that on diffusion, these blotchy stuff, all this kind of patchy stuff is also kind of bright. Uh, you know, um, T1 pre, you know, not a great quality. Again, patients moving, uh, inpatient sick. But you can see kind of discrete little hypodense areas here and there. And this is T1, this is the arterial phase, again, very, very uh, motiony. And this is the forward in this phase, or this delayed phase. Now you can see all of these lesions are hyper enhancing. Okay. So we have these really kind of weird lesions that teach, you know, the slightly T2 hyper intense, slightly diffusion restriction, probably hyper enhancing on arterial phase, kind of hyper enhancing on delayed. Have, you know, you can see that a lot of these correspond to, you know, like you can see here, all of these, a lot of these correspond to like area of increased pet activity. So they're not like some weird, you know, spared parenchyma, right? Like, um, all right, can we pause for one second? I'm so sorry, I do have to answer this. What would be, okay, anyway, so so those are the lesions, right? So- Well, while you were gone on the phone, we discussed sarcoid versus myelomatous, you know, like AML depositions right. in the liver. Right, so this is, right, so exactly. Remember also patient has fevers and they don't know why. So it is very, very nonspecific. So I, you know, I kind of dictated it, I said, you know, nonspecific, they're, you know, describe the findings, describe the fact that they're, you know, the pet avid. So I said differential diagnosis, some sort of weird infection, weird, you know, atypical, you know, leukemic involvement or, you know, or some sort of uh, suited inflammatory pseudotumors. And the reason I said inflammatory pseudotumors, because I, I've seen pseudotumors that look like this, although not in this multiplicity, uh, maybe like I've seen one, you know, and I've seen them being pet avid and I've seen them look mimic, really mimic tumors. So I put that in and I said, you know, we don't know what it is, so get, get a path. So the, they, they did a path, they did a, um, what do you call it? They did a- um, Biopsy. A, a biopsy, sorry. And the path came back, I'm just gonna read out. Uh, so no, no evidence of AML, liver with chronic inflammation, uh, with lymphocytes, plasma cells, and in eosinophils, there's biliary e injury uh, with inflammatory cells, si sinusoidal dilatation, uh, hepatocyte ballooning, and then the findings are not entirely specific, and the differential diagnosis is, includes autoimmune-like hepatitis and drug-induced toxicity. So these are these are kind of inflammatory. So I'm, I'm taking them to be like equivalent of inflammatory pseudotumor. So it sounds like there's some sort of inflammatory process going on in the liver and it's more focused. So these are inflammatory pseudotumors, I think. Wow. Yeah, interesting. But yeah, yeah. I don't know. <laughs> Makes sense and need to biopsy. Right, I mean, there's, there's like, you know, it, it, once you get into like, it's, it, the only thing we can say on the MAR that they are real, they're not like pseudo lesions, they're not um, like the actual things, right? They're not like artifacts, uh, you know, from, from pet. Um, they're actual, there's something going on in the slipper. And then beyond that, this is such a nonspecific appearance that, you know, it just needs a biopsy. I mean, I didn't think like, like this is not, this does not look like any infection that we generally see. But because patient had this unexplained fever, I kind of felt like I have to put it in just, you know. Uh, and, and to be honest, inflama inflammatory pseudotumors were kind of my, my top. It just kind of shows you like how interesting and complex the liver is too, right? Like it can, yes. like so many things can affect it and they just have so many different appearances that it's, oh, yeah. I don't know, we're still like dependent on biopsy. Oh, for sure. But but notice how the path was very wishy-washy, you know, non-specific could be. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 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 It's, it's confusing. When you sit down with those pathologists, you realize how confusing it is too for them too. Yeah, because I think I think I think it's very similar in, in a way it's similar to, to you know to us, where you know, you know, the the 
body can only do so much in terms of like variety of responses. And sometimes these responses are, um, you know, like that. In between, yeah. Yeah. And, so, and there's overlap and. Uh, this is a patient who had a CT perform, I forget the indication, but uh, the study, well, there's an incidental finding. Uh, and uh, no, so the incident, renal, renal lesion? No, it's the pancreas. Uh, oh. Okay. Oh, I'm, trying, I'm trying to window it. <laughs> <laughs> maybe if I can, maybe the coronal is a little bit easier to see here. It looks so much like the spleen. I'm favoring an intrapancreatic splenule, but we always then think about like neuroendocrine versus splenule. Yes. So that, that's, those are the, the main differentials that were, so what are you, that were raised? What, what, what are you going to recommend next? Uh, liver spleen scan. Liver. Okay. So the patient had a sulfur colloid. Right. That's all my study. Time. And this was what it looked like. So not, it was not hot. No, exactly. It, it was no. not hot. So here it is, this thing here. Yeah, right there. Uh, so the patient went on to get an EUS, and this was still a splenule. Wow. Uh, and I'm so the say it looks point... so much like a splenule. Like maybe this, I guess maybe sulfur colloid isn't as sensitive as we think. Yes, and that's what the teaching point here is. Uh, so our nuclear medicine, one of our NUCMED rads uh, shared this. And if you're looking for intra, like a splenule, uh, like an intrapancreatic splenule, RBC is more sensitive than sulfur colloid. So in the future, if you're concerned about a, an intrapancreatic splenule, recommend a, a RBC. So my nuclear medicine guys have said that they don't do that anymore because it's very cumbersome. Like oh. it's just not easy to do maybe because yeah. like, I don't know, to damage the RBCs, but we've, we've discussed this before. Where we're like, should we recommend one or the other? And they're like, we basically don't do heat damaged RBC scans anymore. Oh. But this case is a great point for like, maybe we should. Um, the, the other one, the other that thing was, is MR, right? You I was going to say the other thing we frequently do is MR <laughs> um, or iron. Like, give what? Is, what are the iron agents that we can give? Thermoxifol. But I think we. I mean, even just a regular MR, if it's following the spleen on every sequence, really bright on DWI, modeled appearance on arterial phase, homogeneous later, um, and like looks like exactly like the spleen on in and out of phase and everything. Uh, then we often will just say it's a splenule, but it is, I don't know, our, our group, we go back and forth about like, should we recommend an MR or sulfur colloid, but we have not revisited the heat damage RBC scan. So that's a good point. Are you guys able to order that? Like, is that, are you guys still doing those? Well, this, the suggestion came from our new uh, team. So I hope we can. Yeah. Sounds like you could. Cool. Okay, so this is this, you know, the, this the age and sex are relevant. This is a woman in her 50s, mid 50s, and um it was she had an abdominal pain somewhere else in another hospital and they they did an ultrasound and they found lesions. So now she's coming in for a more. So you can see here in segment two, very superior, you can see a lesion, right? You can see that there's another one down here, but I'm just fo focusing on the big one. They're identical in, in, in appearances, right? So you can see in phase, out of phase, the lesion like markedly drops in signal. Um, so there's intracellular fat. And then if you compare the, um, you know, if you compare the, uh, in phase, which is basically your T1 with that fat set, and then uh, your pre contrast T1 with fat set, you can see that there's also signal drop, right? So that means the lesion has both intracellular and macroscopic fat, so both micro and macroscopic fat. You can see on T2, kind of it's not a great location, so probably ISO um, on DWI. Again, it's, Wait, Victoria, can you show like the T2 with and without fat set? I wish I could. We just don't do them. Oh, because <laughs> I was going to say, I've never done this where you're comparing 
the in phase to the fat set. Well, it it, it it's valid, right? Because, because well, I I I'm because if you see the in and out, like I don't see India Inc. No, no, no. It it's not it's not enough to to cause the okay. So basically, somewhere in the spectrum between. Correct microscopic like 50 50 it, it, as, as, as far as as far as a mars concerned this this has this has enough fat to consider macroscopic okay but but not enough to cause the it's not like does that make sense anyway so you can see that the lesion does have arterial face you know again patient is breathing unfortunately you can see uh, but you can see clearly the lesion enhances more than the liver. And you can see that the other one also did that. So there's arterial face hyper enhancement. And then I'm just going to jump here. You can see that um, there's washout, right? Maybe there's a capsule, maybe not. It's hard, again, to judge here. You can see that it's very hypo-intense on hepatobiliary phase. Beautiful liver parenchyma, healthy person. And here's the other lesion. Um, and then... You know, DWI, it's, you know, I, I wouldn't trust the fact that we don't see anything because there's, you know, again, this is a very unfortunate position for DWI. Um, you can see there's just, just loss of signal right there. Uh, questionable if this was, if there's, you know, diffusion restriction in fairly, it's hard to judge. Anyway, so we have a uh, lesion with micro and microscopic fad. We have arterial face up enhancement. We have washout. And she has no history of liver disease, right? No history. This is this is a workup of an incidentally uh, found uh, liver lesions. And you can see that also. Hold on. Her liver's fatty. The, the liver is fatty. So we're also thinking like adenomas, like right. HNF one alpha versus inflammatory. Correct. Well, uh, HNF one HNF1 alpha, right? Because right? there's yeah. there's definitely fat, yeah. right? Yeah. But they can be combo, right? Oh yes. Yeah. Yeah, we had a case of combo that I shared before. Just um just so I know, like because the inflammatory ones often do have the enhancement and washout. HNF alpha also. Actually okay. the, the, the collection of inflammatory I have more commonly have AFI and then they become ISO. ISO yeah. on portal in the say. Okay. Uh, but adenomas can like enhance and very like you know, they often can do this AFI and washout, right? They, I, I have, you know, I have a bunch which go ISO and then hypo, a bunch which are hyper and then ISO. So they can really do various, there's no like a single typical enhancement pattern. Anyway, so the reason I'm showing this case, because, you know, if I told you that this patient has hep B, we would just say HCC and be done with it. Um, but this patient with healthy liver, so we read it as, you know, uh, in in you know in a healthy you know in a healthy middle aged woman, you know these are consistent with HNF alpha uh, inactivated adenomas. Differential diagnosis is HCC, and then if the patient has some sort of proven uh, risk factors for uh, HCC, then this would be LIRS five. So the patient had a biopsy, and these are HNF alpha adenomas. But I, I, again, and what are they planning to do? I actually don't know that. Just they're probably watch these. These are like the. I mean, the, the path came back today, so I don't know. Um, <laughs> I was gonna say, but these are the best, better prognosis right. ones. So I, I, I yeah. sometimes they, they, you know, this is almost five centimeters. Sometimes they, they, they may want to embolize a bigger one because it's kind of getting to five centimeters in order to prevent bleeding. But then. They sometimes do that in younger women who want to get pregnant, so they don't have to deal with this when she's, you know, when the patient gets pregnant. She's older, she's in her 50s, she's probably not gonna, you know, a good chance she's not gonna get pregnant. So they may just watch her um, just because of size and they just watch her. Okay, not an eye test. Hi. Hmm. So we've got I'll take these marks off. Heterogeneous mass. Um, you guys can decide where you think it's centered and what it is. It's a woman. Yes. Uh, can you see the? Can you show the coronal? Uh huh. I just wanted to see if we'll look at the guiding structures. Make sure it's. 
Okay, I think it's just compressing the gonadal veins without arising. Or is it like a sarcoma, maybe? Like an angiosarcoma, because there's so much vessels within it. The other, initially, I thought it was a lymphoma, but when I see all of those vessels and kind of coursing down south, I think angiosarc, I'd put that in there. Okay. So good. You guys are thinking about sarcoma. Here's the uterus. Here are the large gonadal vessels going into this mass. Um, and I would say that, you know, just based on here, it looks like it's probably arising, like it's a retroperitoneal mass. Yeah. Like it, it pushing, looks separate from the ovaries. Uh -huh, separate from the ovary, which is probably down here. And not really, yeah, not really centered in the ovary area, but centered in the retroperitoneum, pushing the um, all the bowel anteriorly and all the mesenteric vessels anteriorly. So when we think about retroperitoneal masses, we think about sarcomas. Most common is liposarcoma and then leiomyosarcoma, um, also solitary fibrous tumors. One thing you said, lymphoma. So this looks too heterogeneous to me to bring up lymphoma immediately. Yeah. Like these, those tend to be blander, multifocal. So this kind of has more of a sarcoma look with this, you know, kind of heterogeneous appearance and central necrosis. So if we're thinking about a retroperitoneal sarcoma and it's got gonadal vessels going into it, you brought up angiosarcoma. Um, that's more common in the spleen, liver. So what's a more common sarcoma, you know, maybe arising from or involving the gonadal vessels? Lyomyosarcoma? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So this was just a huge lyomyosarcoma arising from the left uh, gonadal vessels. Um, in this case, it actually like, I mean, we don't always see all these really engorged vessels involved with it, but anytime you see a retroperitoneal, large, huge sarcomatous kind of thing going in a linear kind of fashion, um, and it's, you know, in the location of the IVC or the gonadal vessels, always think about a leiomyosarcoma arising from one of those vessels. Um, so this was biopsy proven gonadal vein leiomyosarcoma. Wow. Um, and uh, it was actually involving kind of too much right now. The patient's older, so they um, are, are undergoing chemo radiation, but it's not very chemo radiosensitive. The ideal is to resect these. Um, and yeah, it's not, it's not responding very well. So. Okay. I have, I have a companion to my case, but give me. Is that why there's gas in the mass? Oh, post, probably because they really biopsied it. Yeah. Oh, I see. Although actually, hold on, let me see. Mm -hmm. You know, they, you know, could involve a adjacent. Like, well, nobody, wait, uh, nobody called me about the first one. I was waiting. <laughs> oh, I think she's talking to someone else. Oh, okay. I'm going to stop sharing. Okay. What's my number? <laughs> 